my window which has canvas open and i'm again sorry not to be there today i don't feel the most horrible in the world but i felt bad enough to take a covid test and that's what it is so i'm not gonna be on campus today so those that are in my urban geography class too we'll have class via teams as well um so today uh what i plan for us to do is basically just give you a lecture for the first bit of class for about 25 30 minutes about digital elevation models and interpolation of surfaces um and then release you to work on your labs. Uh, but before that, maybe there are some questions related to um, either the journal or the lab uh, before I leave. Um, we'll, we'll cover those as well. OK, so we'll go ahead and get started now. And so I'm going to minimize Canvas. And hopefully you're all seeing my PowerPoint screen. Is that true? I'm going to assume it's true. Great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so uh, in the background here, we've got some kind of digital model of the Earth's surface. We can all probably recognize that as the Western United States on the left. Um, if we follow my cursor, you can probably see the Bay Area, of San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. And then we can see the great uh, Central Valley of California, the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and the Basin and Range. Um, what type of uh, model of the Earth's surface is this? I would have asked in class, and I won't wait for the response here, but um, it's a hill shade model, right? And we can see that uh, because we can see one side of each of these ranges is uh, illuminated and the other side is shadowed. And so this is a product of a digital elevation model, um, basically a calculation uh, to kind of simulate a visualization of the landscape. Most digital elevation models look kind of boring. They just grade from light to dark or across colors to show almost like contours of elevation. But because they're so detailed, you can, if you zoom in, you hardly see any difference from one pixel to the next. Uh, but with a hillshade model, we get a nice visualization that simulates something like what we might see from a plane. And so we're going to talk about DEMs. Uh, their products and um, interpolating them in this lecture. And uh, you've probably all used them before, but hopefully this helps uh, kind of codify some of the terminology in your head and maybe you learn a few new things too. Okay. So DEMs are a type of raster or continuous GIS data. They're made of row pixels uh, where the pixels have some sort of fixed um, uh, dimensions of row height and column length. Um, and so a common uh, pixel size for a digital elevation model might uh, be, say, 30 meters if it's like a global scale DEM uh, or like maybe a regional scale DEM. There's actually a one kilometer pixel global scale DM called eTopo30 that you can get a hold of if you ever want to um, kind of display uh, what the Earth looks like across the entire surface. It's really cool because it also shows bathymetry at the one kilometer pixels. Uh, but more commonly, uh, you've probably dealt with 30 meter regional pixels um, or 10 meter from the USGS, or perhaps you've even worked with LIDAR. Uh, I'm going to back up. So this image that you see here, this one is probably one of these regional 30 meter pixel data sets. It's very good for visualizing whole regions, whole mountain ranges. And you can actually calculate some pretty important metrics about things like tectonic activity uh, using these resolutions of DEMs, uh, compare one mountain range to another. Um, uh, this data, if we went back uh, 20 years ago, when I started in grad school about 20, 2003, uh, during 2004, uh, my task as a, as a research assistant was to take this new seamless data that the USGS had provided, I think it was at a 10 meter pixel scale at that point in time, for the entire conterminous US, and, and make a digital elevation model of the whole US. And so that was a big 
big undertaking in 2004. And so we've come a long way since then. Really near that time, LiDAR data was just coming out and that gets us down to like meter scale or less pixels. Um, but, you know, this whole thing of digital topography really was taking off in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, and it really ramped up quickly. Okay, so other types of rasters can be air photos, satellite images, any sort of base maps you might be using. Uh, but they are representing continuous things across the landscape, or at least trying to. So elevation obviously has representative values everywhere in the landscape. We don't have black holes on Earth. Um, other things like thematic maps can be used for land cover, representing continuous uh, what the Earth has on the Earth's surface across all, all areas. And then other things should be continuous, like in your lab, you're working with rainfall data or temperature data, but we don't often have the sensors available to track these values everywhere on the Earth's surface at all times. And elevation, of course, changes with time too, but we're not worried about the rates of those changes uh, being so fast that we need to update our map every day, like temperature or precipitation. So elevation is easier, but we could do those other things as well. Um, so today, you know, some of the best uh, digital elevation model products are coming from what's called LIDAR, light detection and ranging. So here you can see um, some point cloud data of LIDAR. And these are for kind of urbanized areas. And the LIDAR is collected usually from above, either from a plane or a drone, but it can also be collected from a car zooming around a city, like the LIDAR puck swirling around. And what it's doing is shooting out a light pulse and getting a reflection uh, to map the landscape. Um, and so it also requires really high resolution uh, GNSS global positioning system information for where is that sensor and then therefore the point cloud also knows where those points are in space. Um, it can collect other things like the color of whatever was reflected uh, can be ascribed to the points uh, or the intensity of the return. So you can imagine that some items are more reflective than others, like maybe a metal object might be more reflective than one tree leaf. Um, and so those intensity values can be color coded um, or the color of the actual item might be color coded, which allows us to help maybe classify what is, is that point value. You can right away see what is a tree versus what is a road or a car. And so um, the, the beautiful thing of LIDAR is we're collecting information about everything, the ground surface, buildings, the trees. And so then we have those data sets and we can start to or disaggregate them into um, classified points. And then we can take those classified points and do things with them, like look at tree, tree canopy structure or map out building heights or damage in an earthquake. Um, or we can just get the bare earth and interpolate what the ground looks like. Uh, to get a digital elevation model or a digital surface model. Uh, why do we need such high resolution data? Um, well, you know, early on, most of this high resolution data was coming from either really specific studies, like funded by research for things like looking at tropical forest canopies that we see on the upper right, or urban kind of things like uh, you know, greenness of urban areas, but more likely it would be for hazards things like we see in the lower left um, with this uh, flood model. Uh, because we have really high resolution pixels with LIDAR, we can get down to uh, less than half a meter representation of what the ground is in terms of elevation everywhere. So we can re make really detailed um, models of flood inundation and map out risk or uh, real disasters as well. And so that potentially has a lot of value to humanity. And so most of the early LIDAR data sets, even here in Utah, started with cities, but it's now expanding out. And uh, the goal of this program called 3DEP, 3D Elevation Program, 
by the USGS is to map all of the US at three meters resolution or better. Uh, most of the areas are going to be like more like one meter. Um, in terms of thinking about landscape, so this is, I believe, Portland, Oregon, and this is not the most best image that I've got up here. It's a little pixelated, but it is actually from a really high resolution topographic data set, most likely like a one meter LIDAR. We can see really detailed things about the landscape, geomorphology and geology from the LIDAR as well. We can see uh, the Columbia River, uh, where the main floodplain is. We can see higher floodplain river terraces, um, terrace risers. We can sense flows of, of past floods that have come through. Some of those may be related to glacial outburst floods and things like that. And we can also see areas of landscape that maybe we could capture what has never been touched by that river system and is representing other geomorphic processes. So I, I really love to use LIDAR in in uh, geomorphology class. And so if you take that with me next fall, uh, we'll do a lot of this same sort of stuff. Okay. Is everything still going OK? I see that my video is stuttering a little bit. OK, great. Thanks, Matt. OK, so uh, interpolation. So to get a digital elevation model, um, DEM, we need to do interpolation. And so that means we have to take the values from the LIDAR point cloud. LIDAR is by definition a point cloud, not a digital elevation model, and interpolate it uh, to a digital surface or terrain model. So a, a, so a couple of new acronyms, digital surface model, digital terrain model. So sometimes the interpolations that you get from LIDAR are just digital surface models. So that would be going over the top, the envelope of the outside of the point cloud. And so you get the top of the tree canopies, the top of the buildings, top of the cars, like we're seeing on the upper right. Uh, so that's a digital surface model. Uh, but if you do enough filtering to figure out what is trees, what is houses, cars, et cetera, we can filter out those things that aren't representing the terrain and build a digital terrain model or a DTM. A DEM is more generic. Um, it's not really telling you one or the other. I would like to think that DEM is more like a terrain model, but it's not always the case. OK, so be careful with that and um, try to be accurate with what you're um, presenting if you're doing research using digital terrain models say so because you're being more specific. Um, and so these are uh, DEMs, DSMs, DTMs. Uh, you might think that they're kind of 3D representations of the Earth, but they're really kind of more like two and a half D. They're not fully three dimensional because, uh, you know, you could see the opening of a cave, but you can't see under the cave. You can't go inside the building. Uh, it doesn't see things like culverts going under city streets and things like that uh, or a roadway crossing. And so if you have LIDAR and you want to do like something like a stream modeling effort, you're going to have to like fudge it where a stream crosses a road because it's going to break your model. And so, yeah, they're two and a half dimensional, not 3D. OK, so what to do to do this interpolation? So tip to get to a DTM, digital terrain model, we want to classify points, um, select the desired points, the ground, and sample within those points uh, and use some mathematical model to, in, to kind of uh, interpolate the elevation into, of the ground into pixels, right? So you're taking points which have some density so maybe there's only like five points for every square meter. And maybe you want to produce a, a one meter pixel. So which of those points represents the value of that pixel? Is the average of them? Do you need to think about the neighboring points? A lot of times uh, what's done is something like inverse distance weighting, where you consider all the points within so many meters, probably a couple meters of the centroid of the pixel that you're trying to define, and you weight the ones nearer to the centroid more in terms of their values, and the ones in the neighboring 
area a little less, and then that ascribes the value of that pixel. Um, if you want to learn more about this, you could click on those links, um, uh, and it talks about how you consider point density uh, to try to do your interpolations, but I'm not going to go into that here. And so I just mentioned IDW, you could use other models of interpolation in the lab that you're doing for this class, you're going to use uh, a few and you're not doing elevation, you're doing interpolating uh, precipitation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, IDW, Krieging, Spline, and TIN, these are probably the most common ones that you'll see people use. And I, I like this figure on the left um, because it shows nicely, you see these um, pick points. So from, imagine they're from your point cloud, these blue points, right? We got four of them. The TIN is basically a linear interpolation between each point. So it's just connecting the dots. And so that honors the data perfectly, um, but it doesn't do any sort of modeling of what happens in between. Uh, it just go, it's just a linear interpolation. Um, inverse distance weighting is often done, as I mentioned, but you can see that it doesn't necessarily cross any of the point cloud uh, because it considers the values of the neighboring points. And so it's gonna be more smooth generally, and it's going to represent uh, some of the variability within the neighborhood. Krieging uh, is a statistical model. Um, maybe it's a little bit complex for me to describe simply off of this diagram. I encourage you to read about it some more, uh, but you can weight that model in a number of different ways. And it also doesn't necessarily go through the point cloud. And there's a lot of buttons to tune if you do this in ArcGIS Pro and it can and so so you know if you just use the default settings you're not necessarily getting the best model for uh, your particular cloud of points um, and so it needs a little bit more thought uh, to do it well but it often is used because it has so many buttons to tune that you can make uh, some pretty smart choices and so if you uh, are remembering back to the lab and you started to geo-reference the prism, uh, sorry, the prism uh, data on precipitation, it actually is using a combination of uh, some sort of Krieging model that is informed by elevation because as air lifts, you get more precipitation. And so by adding in that elevation with Krieging, they can pr produce a really smooth and um, kind of naturally not necessarily accurate, but reasonable model of how rainfall varies across the land. Spline is another one, and that one does have to go through the points, uh, just like uh, TIN, but it is not using a linear interpolation. It is a polynomial, right? So you can see that it bends around, but that means you could get values lower or higher than any of your real values on the ground. So it looks really nice and smooth, but it could have some areas of inaccuracy if you don't have a dense point cloud. If you have a really dense point cloud, then spline can be really good. OK, so hopefully that gives you a sense for at least these four. There were other some other ones in the lab, point and terp and some other things. I would encourage you to read about those some more. Uh, you have to for your journal. OK, so I will talk about some more things here briefly. So I'm not going to dwell too much, but TIN, just to define it, uh, the acronym is Triangulated Irregular Network. OK, and so um, positives, it doesn't over interpolate, represents the data well. Um, and so you can see down here what a TIN looks like. It looks like a triangular mesh. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's not so smooth. So if you have areas without many points, you get big smooth surfaces, which might not accurately represent the landscape there. So that that is a negative. But if you have pretty continuous um, similar density points and they're pretty high resolution, tin can be very good. OK, IDW, inverse distance weighting. I think I, I kind of described it pretty well before. It creates smooth surfaces that mimic reality. Um, and you can also put in things like break lines to be smarter with things. 
So if you know, for instance, that you're trying to model a river terrace and you know where that river terrace is, you can put a brake line in there to actually make a hard, uh, a harder turn than a um, kind of smooth surface would from the IDW. So, so you can tune it. Um, usually you don't do that if you don't have a lot of other field data collected. Um, yeah, negative would be that none of the cell values actually intersect the data necessarily. So it's clearly not perfectly accurate. And uh, yeah, so on the positive for spline goes through the actual data points. A negative, it forces the topography to be smooth and follow a parabolic shape, which sometimes can be unrealistic in the case of a cliff or something like that. But if you're thinking about hill slopes that are, uh, if you take into geomorphology and thinking about diffusive processes, those are usually parabolic. And so the spline actually can do a fairly good job there. Um, Krieging, uh, so this uh, is good when there can be a directional bias in the data. Um, if you know the directional bias, and so that's the thing about PRISM, right? They know the elevation. If you have higher elevation or steeper elevation, you're more likely to get more rain. Uh, so that's why they use that. Uh, negative, again, doesn't necessarily fit through the data points. And, um, and, and so you have to deal with those multi-directionality biases. Otherwise, it's not necessarily going to be as good as some of the other models, or it's, it's going to be, it's going to have inherent biases in it. Uh, natural neighbors, I didn't show a diagram of this one. So it's similar to IDW. It uses weighted average interpolation, uh, but it also incorporates a triangulation procedure similar to a TIN. Um, as a result, the surface doesn't intersect the original data points quite like a tin, but it has some curvature to it. So it's not just flat surfaces like a tin. So it's a good in between between IDW and tin. Um, so it does kind of honor the input data, but it allows some natural curvature like we'd see in a real landscape. And that works for elevation well. Probably works for, therefore, precipitation. Not necessarily for temperature, which can be highly related to the surface contrasts, like if you go over a road versus a grass field. OK, so here's a little uh, kind of grid that you could use um, or a table that you could use about the kind of properties of these different interpolation methods that you could use and what they're uh, good for. And so I know some of you have already done your interpolations, but if you haven't gotten there yet and you want to select which three that you want to test, you could use this to help you. OK, so let's back over to digital elevation or digital terrain models, and we'll talk about um, derivative products that we often use from those. So a digital elevation model, such as a slope map or a hill shade, those are calculated from digital elevation models. So in the upper left is a DEM. And I mentioned before, you know, you can see a lot of details in here. You can see maybe where the low values are low or kind of more dark. So you can see where the river should be. This is a Capital Reef field station for UVU, the present creek area. And you can see things like fractures going through the rocks and the cliffs. But it's not very, it's kind of fuzzy. Uh, and so these derived products like slope, where we calculate either percent or degrees of slope, can tell us better where exactly that cliff is, or where the edge of a river terrace is, or where the stream bottom is. Um, so this is a slope map. And it's colored from red steep to light, uh, low, low slope green. You can also color it uh, in kind of a gray shade where it goes from uh, steep is dark and uh, shallow is light. And that will produce something called a slope shade map, which will look similar to the hill shade map that you see down here, except that there will be no shading. Uh, or there'll be shading everywhere. It won't be directionally biased. There'll be shading on both sides of the hill, not illumination on one side and shading on another. And so these uh, are all local interpolation models of uh, of your of your grid. 
So you have your digital elevation model pixels and you're looking at the neighboring pixels. There's a neighborhood analysis and you're calculating uh, the change in elevation to get slope or you're calculating some illumination from an artificial sun angle to get hill shade. Um, and so, you know, we could do the math on that. It's all inherently built in to ArcGIS Pro, but and we'll use the tool called um, uh, Surface. And under there, there's a uh, raster tools for all these things. But there's actually um, some more sophisticated tools in there. If you want to tune how the slope is calculated, there are a few options because you can imagine you do that math a few different ways. Uh, and you can also tune things like the hill shade. How much shading or illumination do you want? You can put the sun angle higher or lower in the sky. Um, so more things that we can do. So we can make a uh, you can make a a shaded relief model, which would be a hill shade, uh, but then also add in color. So color shaded relief and the color could be the digital elevation model values. So it'd be almost like having color contours and the shading. Uh, so that's really common. Slope shade I mentioned. Um, you'll have to do some of this in lab one, in the second part. Curvature is the slope of the slope. And so that tells us where the landscape is either concave or convex. So that helps us tell where the top of the hill is versus the bottom of the hill. And so that can be really good for geomorphology and perhaps other applications as well. It shows you where things change really rapidly uh, in the landscape. Uh, we can calculate watersheds, uh, including uh, stream networks in areas, and you can even model flow if you wanted to using DEMs. We can map out the direction that slopes face to produce things called aspect map, or you can use that to uh, calculate the solar incidence, so how much solar energy is coming to a pixel, and figure out where is the best place to put you know, uh, solar panels, things like that. Um, view sheds, that's an interesting one. I've had students do some projects on that before, thinking about um, the value of properties, depending on what they're able to see from that pixel. Um, that's kind of cool. Another student used it once to try to map out where is the best place to hunt, uh, where you can see the most land. Um, and then, Profiles. I love profiles. So lower right here, we'll we'll look at elevation profiles in later labs. OK, so uh, yeah, I, I think we're pretty much about done. We can introduce also contour maps. That's what's over here on the left. This is one of those color shaded relief maps of some volcanoes. And then here we are back at our point cloud. OK, so uh, that's the lecture. I do want to point you to um, one resource that you should be familiar with. Maybe you already are, and that's opentopography.org. It is a website linked on Canvas for us. Um, it's a great resource for LIDAR data, but it's not just for the data. Uh, so you should uh, register as a member of Open Topography because as a member, uh, you will get access to being able to download more data at once, um, which is valuable. You don't have to, you can do a bigger area for your projects. Um, so do register here. The other thing is that you are privileged in that you have .edu email address. So open topography uh, will allow you to download directly uh, the three dep data which hasn't been necessarily released everywhere yet, uh, if you have a .edu email address. Uh, so, at, so register so you can get that 3DEP data too. Uh, Open Topography hosts data from the USGS like 3DEP, but also things that people have produced. So if you've taken geospatial field methods, with Dr. Buns, Dr. Buns has actually submitted some data sets and related to his classes and research uh, to Open Topography, and anybody can get that data now. Um, and so it hosts little projects and big projects, and you have access to it if you use open topography. They also have some resources uh, for tools that can be used to process LIDAR and do interpolations. Some of those actually plug into GIS, ArcGIS Pro. Others are in other programs, uh, but 
But just remember that is here. If you get into this a lot, this is a great resource for you. It's a, yeah, one of the best uh, kind of community resources on elevation data. So I'll stop the lecture here. Wow, right on time, 9.15. And uh, yeah, so we can open up to a couple questions that you may have, and I can go back to my slides if you want. Any questions, Matt? Matt. No questions. OK, what about the lab and the journals? Do you, I know that three people started working or maybe even completed the journal already. I didn't talk too much about journal deadlines. Um, the deadlines are kind of suggestions, so I really appreciate that those that have already done the journal because it's going to help you in the lab. So with this lecture, um, but I don't actually probably intend to grade it today. So if you don't get it in today, it's not late. I will try to grade it before our next class on Tuesday. Uh, so try to get it done this weekend if you can. So that's one thing about the journal. And then um, if there are any questions about questions on the journal, I can field those now too. All good. OK, so uh, I guess what I'll say is this. So why don't you all uh, break and go work on your labs? And um, I'll stay on Teams for about 15 minutes in case any individual people want to hop on and talk to me about questions they might be having. And then I'll take off around 9.30, 9.35. And I'll stop recording now. And I'll post this to Canvas.